When you're speaking with a non-marketer who just wants their product to succeed and they say to you, hey, we have to make something go viral. I just, yeah. I just can't handle it. Why? I just, I can't handle it. And I, I understand, of course we want, I can't even say the V word, but you know what I mean. Of course we want something to go schmiral. We'll say schmiral. <laughs> um, but it doesn't just happen because you're creating this idea in a room, right? It happens because you snag onto something in the news cycle and it happens from, you know, creating smart narratives around something that consistently grow. and. Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples. Not just trending ideas or buzzword-laden schmaltz. Real-world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. I get a lot of PR pitches from Marketing Sherpa. A heck of a lot. That's a nice way to say it. And here's the biggest flaw in most of the pitches I see. They are focused on themselves. It might literally be themselves for some people doing their own pitching, but mostly it's PR pitches focused on their message or their product, whatever their client is trying to, for lack of a better word, shill. But then, among all that, there are those beautiful golden needles in a haystack that put the marketing Sherpa audience first, that focus on what value they can bring to our audience, whether through our written case studies or for guests right here on the How I Made It in Marketing podcast. So when I read this lesson about PR in a podcast guest application, it resonated with me right away. Don't spray and pray. We'll hear the story behind that lesson, along with many more lesson-filled stories from Lauren Gumpert, VP of Communications and Brand at Fay. Thank you for joining us, Lauren. Thanks for having me. All right, so I'm going to look at your background real quick, cherry picking from your LinkedIn here. Uh, you started as an account executive at Ketchum, where you worked on MasterCard, Nestle, Obamacare. Uh, you were director of communications at Playbuzz, director of uh, global communications at Brand Strategy at Guesty. You've managed teams of 10 plus. You've managed million dollar budgets. And right now you are VP of communications and brand at Faye. Tell people who Faye is real quickly. Faye has pulled in $8 million in a seed funding round led by Viola Ventures and F2 Venture Capital. It also uh, had participation from former NBA player Omri Caspi, which is super cool. Um, so give us a sense. What is your day like as VP of communications and brand at Faye? Yeah. So, I mean, every day is different, which I, I really like. Um, we're at the beginning, you know, we launched earlier this year. We built Faye Travel Insurance during COVID. We then announced our seed funding and things are moving so quickly, you know, soon after we were named this must download travel app by Footers Travel. And this means because we're a new brand in really an ecosystem that is dominated by legacy players, I would say. We're focused on building, you know, trust and credibility so travelers get to know us, so they get to know what travel insurance should be, so they have confidence in our product, and so they continue to travel with us, of course. And this means a lot of time spent investing in our brand. For example, you know, the travel insurance copy that you read on our website, it's not confusing jargon or mumbo jumbo. You actually know what you're protected for when you purchase a FAY policy. And... Um, and creating copy about travel insurance is is no easy feat. If you're in the insurance ecosystem, you know this. So so it takes quite a bit of time. Well, I, before we get into your specific stories, that just piques my ears. Because how did you work with the legal team and compliance and whoever? Insurance must be a really difficult product to not have too much mumbo jumbo for. I've worked for yeah. worked in real estate. I've written radio ads for a major car brand I won't mention. And the radio ads were so frustrating. It's like a 30 second spot and 10 seconds were, you know, the yeah. speed reading of some, you know, compliance. So any tips there for working with your your legal friends to make that happen? I would say patience and a glass of wine at the end of the day. <laughs> no, I mean <laughs> You know, insurance and compliance go hand in hand. And, you know, Faye really wants to do things differently um, in terms of how we talk about travel insurance and how we approach it. And that can be really scary um, for those who have been in the industry for a long time and, and aren't used to that. So I would say it's a lot of patience. It's a lot of iterations. It's making sure that everything is factually correct, but easily digestible uh, to consumers, to travelers. All right, great. Well, we're going to unpack some lessons from your current role, your previous roles. Let's jump into it and let's look at some lessons you've learned from your career, from the things you made in marketing. Uh, your first lesson is take other suggestions into account with the understanding that you're the pro, that pro 
excuse me, let me try that again. Take others' suggestions into account with the understanding that you're the pro in your field and have the final say. So Lauren, how did you learn this lesson? I mean, I'm always asking people for help and I'm kind of like a a frequent question asker in general. And, you know, lucky for me in the field I am in now, which is travel, and most people that you meet nowadays are travelers, right? Traveler is no longer a luxury, it's a right. So when it comes to, you know, fake product copy or the purchase process or the website or, you know, creating an iteration of the website before launch, I get to ask my friends, I get to ask my family, I really get to ask anyone I meet about their feedback. And, and, and then it's about, you know, kind of even putting people mentally into little focus groups. So like for me, it's people who have traveled with travel insurance before and people who haven't and what messages resonate with them and, and make them want to purchase your product. So I've had some of the best advice from just people I've sat next to in a plane. You know, when you find out what they do, you pick them, you're sitting there with them for a few hours. So you're on a plane and you're like, you know, hey, you got some good travel insurance there? Like, is, is this trip insured? Like, are you like just kind of picking at the different people you meet? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I would say that like I'm, I'm a talker, right? I could talk to a wall. So I was recently remote for, you know, a month traveling uh, and working remotely at the same time. So I constantly was asking everyone, including the people who checked me in at the hotel, if they could check out our app and let me know what they think is working and what's not working. Yeah. So I also wonder how getting suggestions from others like helps you better understand the customer. Like when you're in that conference room, when you're debating with the CTO or the CEO, whoever about what approach you're going to take, are you able to like pull in those stories into that conversation? And I'll tell you why. You know, we've got a free digital marketing course. And in the above the fold psychology section, Flint McLaughlin teaches, remember the prospect is a person. Do not talk at them, talk to them. And so important to remember the humanity of the people on the other side, because We've got these databases, these CRMs, these email platforms, it's you know, analytics, numbers, 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 but there's actually human beings. So have you ever been able to like pull into the, you know, the company wants to take it one direction. You're like, well, look, I was sitting next to Bob oh, yeah. on the plane and he, you know, get a sense of like, bring that in and help you win the battle, so to speak. Oh, for sure. I, I always do it with data though. So I will always take a data driven approach to, okay. to any type of argument I go into a meeting about. So there, for example, you know, we could be everybody could be a fan of creating a CTA button that says, get your trip covered or get covered. And really when we test CTAs, we do an AB test on the website and drive X amount of traffic towards one and check pricing or get a quote, which maybe aren't as fun, but they're working and they're converting more. So I am always going to go into a discussion and a disagreement with numbers to back up my argument. (laughs) That's perfect. We're big fans of A-B testing. Uh, I also wondered, so you talk about when you're a pro, you know, a lot of marketers experience this. So I used to have a boss who joked like, hey, do you think the like CTO ever gets a CEO coming in the office and say, hey, I was thinking last night about some new way to do our JavaScript or, you know what I mean? Like they they usually don't get that. It's us marketers. Everyone thinks they know how to do marketing. So everyone in the organization is like, they got this idea, they got that idea. But in fairness, right, there's areas where we're not a pro. And I wonder like, how do you work with your colleagues to get ideas there for the marketing or for the technology, very technology driven company? So for me, you know, I had uh, written an article for Marketing Sherpa about the job seeker journey. And, you know, I had to reach out to all these HR folks and all because it was, yeah, it was about marketing because it was for marketers, the job seekers journey. But I hadn't, I've been here 13 years. I've been a long time since I looked for a job. So I was like, let me reach into the HR field and see what we can learn from them. So how do you do that? How do you collaborate with others, CTO, CIO, HR, whatever, uh, when you're not a pro? Well, I will say that as a marketer, and I think, you know, I've had this, I have to say to me, said to me so many times, but when you are speaking with a non-marketer who just wants their product to succeed and they say to you, Hey, we have to make something go viral. I just, <laughs> I, just I, I just, I can't handle it. And I, I understand, of course we want, I can't even say the V word, but you know what I mean? Of course we want something to go schmiral. We'll say schmiral. <laughs> um, but it doesn't just happen because you're creating this idea in a room, right? It happens because you snag on to something in the news cycle and it happens from, you know, creating smart narratives around something that consistently grow. And, you know, so I definitely find that setting expectations used to be very hard for me when I was younger. Like five years ago, I could not set people's expectation. I was very much a yes person, which helps nobody. You have to set people's expectations so they understand what type of results that you're going to get them and how and educate them on how you're going to do so. For example, a PR pitch does not mean a sales pitch about your product. It means providing thought-provoking commentary and data-driven statistics about a timely topic. 
for me, when I need help on a topic that I'm not a pro in, I will cold email people. I will ask my friends for friends that they have um, who are professionals in the areas that I need help in. And nine times out of 10, those individuals will always sit and meet me for a coffee. They will, all it costs is their time. And I've, it's only done good things for me, I would say. Um, when it comes to like building your your career, I know we kind of spoke about this, you know, if I can offer suggestions for people, it's first of all, speak to those individuals, grow your network. And this is going to sound super lame. I'm going to say it anyway. Invest time in LinkedIn. And, and really, I'm saying like 30 to 45 minutes a week in LinkedIn, widening, broadening your network, connecting with professionals who can help you in areas that you're not a pro in. LinkedIn got me my job. My current job, I got from LinkedIn because those hiring at my company noticed my um, my posts about travel. And of course, now I work at a travel company. So yeah. So I'm really introverted. You're saying cold emailing. Like, yes. what are you, what are you putting in that email? Like, where is, what's the value exchange? What are you, what are you offering? Like, how are you doing that reach out? I mean, I also say like endless pitches from people. So I'd imagine like you really got to stick out in that inbox. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty casual. Like, well, so it's like, it's, I, I will cold LinkedIn message so many people like, Hey, Jessica, saw your awesome post on X topic. I'm looking for a mentor in X area. And I, 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 would really love to meet with you to talk about this topic. Are you free? I'd love to treat you to coffee and and just take 30 minutes of your time. And I've even had, you know, not just in person, I've had virtual phone calls from the people that I've connected with on LinkedIn. And we talk probably like once every few months now. Wow. That's great. Yeah. All right. Yeah, here's our next lesson from Lauren. Being successful doesn't correlate with how many hours are spent in the office, nor does it mean compromising on your work life balance. So Great. I think we, I read this. I want it to be true, Lauren. I want it to be true, but okay. I know I work remotely now. But having worked in an office tends to be the people that are there, like burning the midnight oil or coming early. Like they, they seem like they're doing so well. You know what I mean? Like the, the, if you're like the CMO, if you're leading the organization, like, oh, look at all the work they're putting in. And it's a lot harder to see the effectiveness of that work. So how do you kind of overcome that, you know, butts and seats mentality. Yeah. I mean, I disagree. It's, uh, there's so much value in being in person. First of all, by the way, interpersonal relationships, creating a culture, there is a lot of value to time spent in an office. What I'm saying is that there's no reason today and uh, today's work environment that you should be required to be in an office nine to five, nine to six every day, just because that's what the company wants, right? I think that that does the opposite of what it's supposed to do. I think that fosters actually a bad culture because in today's environment, working remotely and hybrid schedules and flexibility, they're top of mind for top talent. So if you want top talent, you need to evolve as a company. When I see these companies that are kind of like going backwards and they have remote flexible policies during the height of COVID. And now they're saying, oh, wait, actually everyone should come back into the office. It creates a lot of resentment and you're going to lose talent, right? Not to mention being in the office is super social. So that's incredible for culture, but am I more productive in the office or when I'm working remote? When I'm working remote, 100%. Yeah. I'm in, I'm in communications and marketing. I'm writing all day. Um, so I, I, I don't believe that full time in the office equates to success. And I think it actually equates to misery, frankly. <laughs> well, let's talk about working remote in just a moment. But I think you make a good point here about, you know, it's not, you know, it's easy again as a leader to look around and see who's burning the oil, who's staying at the office late. And those are the ones that are successful. Like, do you have an example? I think you mentioned Trustpilot of how you can communicate to your organization in an organic way. Hey, the things we're doing yeah. are working, even if you don't see me at the office at 10 o'clock at night. For sure. So, you know, I'm an over communicator in general. So I think that merchandising your wins internally is super key. Um, we are a Slack company. Um, if you are a Slack company, you know what that means. So we're very little email, et cetera. So whenever we get any type of media mention or new partnership, new hire, um, you know, celebratory moment, it is shared on Slack in the relevant Slack channel. So with Trustpilot, you know, a, a review site, we had a goal to get to 4.7 out of five um, within six months of launching. We met that goal. We were super excited. So in real time, of course, I'm sharing that with the team. 
I'm providing them with suggested copy that they can share on their own personal social channels. They don't have to, but we're making it this celebratory moment. It makes everybody want to organically share this with their communities. And then in turn, it just helps us with hiring because everyone is seeing all of their friends, all their connections posting about this great achievement of ours in such a short time. Um, then it helps with recruitment. So I would say transparency, sharing your results in real time with the whole team is super key. That's great. I think the other thing, you know, so like I said, uh, you know, from when I started my career at an agency, uh, it was definitely that butts and seats mentality. Who's, you know, coming in the weekend, who's, you know, working late at night and all this stuff. And it, but I think the thing where I struggle with that there is I'm, I'm, I hate, you know, working on the last second on deadline. I know some people get the energy from it. Oh, we're up against the deadlines, dude. I'm always working ahead. I'm always staying ahead of our deadlines. That's how we consistently publish, you know, in marketing Sherpa. And yeah. so when I would see people, you know, oh, they got to work every week and working late, it's because they weren't planning well. Like you said, they're walking around the office, they're talking at the water cooler, they're BSing all day, and then it's only. Be efficient. <laughs> Be efficient, yeah. I mean, for us, when, you know, I started publishing print ads, and so. Um, the deadline was, well, it had to get to the publication at a certain time. And, and then the deadline was, well, FedEx picked up at a certain time. But here's the thing they figured out. Well, FedEx picked up at our office at a certain time, at the local FedEx office at a certain time, and at the airport even later. Oh <laughs> so gosh. they would push the deadline back to like, we'll even drive it to the airport. Yes, so I would, yeah, so it also <laughs> would encourage any leader who's got that mentality, you know, also look like, is it, is, you know, someone not working those late hours because they're efficient and they're planning well and they're not, you know, going around. I have to say this. I think you're, and it's just so funny because if I give a deadline for a project that I assigned to someone on my team and I'm like, Tuesday, end of day, if I'm getting that at Tuesday at 11 p.m., it means that you didn't use the work hours where all of us were are online at the same time in the most efficient way possible. And I'm not going to review that tonight. Like I'm going to review that tomorrow. And if it's a weekend, I'm not going to review it. So yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I really right, well, let's talk about that uh, working remotely bit. And you, I think you said here, just because others just don't get it, it doesn't mean you should stop. So what did yeah. they get? And what, how, did, how did you push forward? You know, I think that because working remotely is now more widely adopted and accepted, there was a time pre-COVID where it wasn't. You know, we knew digital nomads, but but they weren't, you know, so prevalent as they are today, right? So I would go to work remote, you know, and it was agreed upon with my boss. And then other people are kind of wondering where, like, not who are not on my team, oh, she's always on vacation. What are you talking about? What do you mean I'm on vacation? I'm working from a different country just because I'm not physically in the office doesn't mean I'm not working. And I find that mindset so archaic and so old school. It, I'm like turning red. It makes me so frustrated. Um, and at a certain point, I just thought to myself, I have to stop caring about what other people think about my work arrangement because I get the results. I've proven my value and it's working between me and my manager uh, and for the company. So it was more a mindset I probably had to change about myself. And a lot of people also can't always work remotely. You know, you have kids in school or family members you have to take care of. So there was also kind of like this level of, oh, well, she can do it, but I can't. And that's also frustrating. You know, you, so I'm just trying to live, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we're all trying to figure it out. But all right, but let me let me challenge you there a bit, right? Because we're marketers, right? So you say like, yeah. oh, I don't care what anyone else thinks about our what we do is perceived value. We, you know, what customers think about or what our partners think about. What we do as marketers is we shape perceived value, so they can yeah. see that the actual value we create, they can perceive it. So, like, what are some things you've done to help your leaders, your peers, whoever you're working with, to see the perceived value of the work you're putting in as a remote employee? Because I would assume you maybe had to go a little more, a little extra mile to, to communicate that value than for when sure. you were working in the office. So what are some yeah, things you've so learned? I'm an over communicator for sure. You know, any, any type of meeting, it's always video. It's if I am remote video camera on 100%, I'm always overlapping on time zones. So maybe that means starting work way earlier or starting work way later or just frankly being available, you know, throughout the day, just on Slack, email, WhatsApp, et cetera, making myself available. Frequent check-ins, obviously weeklies with my boss and my direct reports. It's just being in touch, constant communication, building trust between not just you and your boss and, and you and those on your team, but everyone at the company. So they understand if I'm not physically there, but I send her a message, she's completely responsive. If I had someone on my team who wanted to work remote, 
and we hadn't worked remote, you know, together before, I said, okay, like, let's do a trial. Let's do a trial. Let's see how this goes. If I found that they were not responsive, that they weren't overlapping on time and that they didn't meet their KPIs, then they would not be allowed to work remotely. You can work remote if you're producing results, if you're meeting and exceeding your expectations, uh, and if you're a high performer. And that's how it should be. You're not, you shouldn't be working remote because you want to do whatever you want to do every day. It's a job. It's still a job. So how do you apply this lesson? The lesson, just because others don't get it, doesn't mean you should stop to your marketing and content, right? So like for me, I've written before about making sure your copy has ear feel. This isn't the fact-based stuff like a value prop. It's more subjective. It's not the function of the creative, it's the form. And when they hear that form, you need the function too. You need the actual information. But when that right audience member, that right ideal customer hears that right form, then they'll get it, right? They won't get it at first, but when they hear it the right way for them, then they'll get it. So I just wonder, this is a great lesson. Just because others don't get it doesn't mean you should stop. How have you, have you applied that to your marketing and your content? I think you need to try to nail copy that people are already thinking, right? So it's like they were thinking it, they just didn't put it in words. And for some reason, your copy represents exactly what they were thinking. So like when I go about building good copy, I'm, I'm trying to understand consumers' pain points and how to approach them with them understanding that what we're providing is the solution without directly saying that, of course, right? I want to capture what they're thinking. And I think that specifically applies to like shorthand copywriting, you know, for PPC ads, Facebook, et cetera. And so like, for example, right now, everyone's losing their bags, right? Nobody wants to lose their bags. Okay. So addressing that, you know, everyone's losing their bags and everyone's buying air tags to track their luggage, me included. Um, Or if I'm writing like an op-ed or a pitch, I always start with the headline or the subject line. It's like what I want people to open with, the feeling that I want them to get when they read what I'm writing. Yeah, don't bury the lead. That's a traditional uh, journalist practice. I love that. Um, Well, we talked about some lessons from the things you made in marketing. Let's look at some lessons from the people you collaborated with. Uh, So this first lesson is when things go wrong, it's an opportunity. And you learn this from Alad Schaefer, the CEO of Faye. So how do you learn this from Alad? Yeah. So Alad is a CEO and co-founder of Faye Travel Insurance. He's my boss. He's an incredible boss who uh, really like fosters me working remotely and and understands that it inspires me. And I lost my phone in a water-related incident. Um, And I wasn't I wasn't available for 24 hours on my phone. And obviously I just was terribly upset over it. I'm in communication. We're always available. I oh, my phone is my best friend. It's terrible. I mean, I'm like prying it away from myself at night so I can get some sleep. It's like a terrible habit. And, and so when I finally got, and Apple delivered me a new phone within literally 24 hours in the middle of nowhere, Arkansas, by the way, don't ask why I was in Arkansas, but <laughs> that, that did happen. Apple really can reach you anywhere. So and I apologized profusely. I mean, and no emergency happened, right? It was, everything was A-OK. And he said, everything's fine. This is an opportunity. And he was right because the whole time I didn't have a phone and all these distractions, I sat and I created an entire plan to get Faye to a place in which we're a mission-driven company. I took my laptop, I sat out in nature, and I just kind of nailed it in that moment. I had a, just, I guess, a bunch of undisturbed thoughts because I didn't have my phone tied to me. Um, and I appreciated that piece of advice. You know, he has great perspective and frankly, he acts as half therapist many times. For me. He's a boss, but he's also really, I swear, he's like my therapist. Um, so Good yeah, CEO. I really thought Roche. Yeah, my CEO. That's a good CEO. He acts as a part-time therapist too. Uh, I, I mean, I love, I love that idea when things go wrong, it's an opportunity, right? There's always an opportunity and everything if we it's it's just if we look at it in the right way right yeah also that idea i wonder do are you now like you're gonna like purposely unplug at times or you know i've seen i have not been good at this but people who message like okay hey for four hours this day or whatever everything's turned off you won't be able to reach me because like you said you just maybe need to go out nature and think and brainstorm and concept like have you ever have you been yet able to work this into your workflow or you know, I don't think I'll ever be that person. I would like <laughs> I know. To. I want to be that person too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, there are, there. Are, you know, when I take a vacation though, I take a vacation. So I, I will just say I take a vacation, but, um, 
You know, I will say that I am trying to be the person who doesn't sleep with a phone on the bedside table next to them. I'm trying to put my phone on the other side of the room. And that's actually working quite well because you're not waking up in the middle of the night and immediately checking your phone, which just kind of wakes up your brain, et cetera. Yeah. So. All right, let's look at the next lesson. It said, don't spray and pray. And you learned this from Perry Hedrick, founder of Crackle PR. So how'd you learn this from Perry? So if you're in PR, you should be following Perry Edrick. He is just, he says everything that PR professionals are thinking. So I didn't necessarily learn this from him, but he put it into words that are, it's exactly what it means. You cannot send a basic PR pitch, the same one, to hundreds of reporters and expect them to be interested in your story. You need to tailor your approach to specific reporters and what they write. For example, hey, Vanessa, I saw you wrote about this topic. I wanted to introduce you to X product because we also address X scenario. Let me know if I can be a source for you for future stories my co-founder can talk to you about, and then you list three topics, right? And Vanessa knows you read her articles. You reached out. You're not sending the same pitch to everybody. Um, Perry has some very keeping it real type of PR tips. If you need a crash course in PR, I would follow him on LinkedIn. He's hysterical. Um, but this this approach has always helped me in PR to achieve top tier media for the brands that I work for. Is first of all, I love hearing this because and marking Sherpa, as I said, we get pitched all the time and we get, you know, some really good pitches and there's also just a ton of spray and pray and they're so focused on themselves. Right. Yeah. Um, but can you walk us through like specifically how you did this for, you know, like a mention you got, I know I saw, uh, you know, I was looking at your application. It was wall street journal and USA today. I think you mentioned New York times. You've gotten some really good mentions like, uh, yeah. like for the wall street journal ones or did you, were you researching that reporter first? Like how, how specifically yeah. were you doing that? So I, you know, I make a targeted media list of who's covered X topics. I reach out with timely data if it's like holiday planning because Thanksgiving is coming up, for example, and there's a reporter that's writing about holiday travel. I'm sending a pitch to them. I remember when I was at PlayBuzz, I, you know, pitched a, uh, I, I noticed that this reporter was covering startups with a really personable and like personal stories about their investors. So I pitched him and I told him, hey, our lead investor loves our product, believes in us so much to the point where they even reserved an office just for themselves within our office so they could work in the same environment as us full time. And that got us the story. You know, another way I got the story was just understanding what was newsworthy. We had a funding round one time, again, at PlayBuzz. Disney was one of the investors, not the lead investor, but one of the investors. And that's really big. It's really big news. So I led with that and it resulted in probably like, I think it was like Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, all of the above. And more recently, you know, I ran into a New York Times reporter at a hotel opening party, found out she was from San Diego, and I messaged her personally because I'm from San Diego. So it's personal, long-term relationships and just being relevant. I think Nobody wants there's... a sales pitch. I'm sorry, go on. Nobody wants a sales pitch. I know. People, I always say, people want to be served. They don't want to be sold, right? You know, I mean, thinking... <laughs> It's true. And as a reporter on the other line, like I, I, we want case studies. We want good guests. That's something we need that we work hard for. So I don't want to ignore pitches. I don't want to say no to pitches. I want them. Yeah. But, you know, there are so many that are so relevant. Again, there's so many I get, they're focused on themselves or whatever they're shilling. There's so much corporate PR speak. Like even when you're like, okay, we've got this good case study. You know, let's get, you know, let's get some advice for the markers, get some advice for our audience, you know, real, real advice from a real human being. It's so much like corporate PR speak with, well, let's work in the keywords and the product mentions we need to get in because we're getting that mention versus, you know, talking like human being. 90% of pitches are probably trash. I think they're trash. And, you know, my pitches are so, it's like, yo, saw you covered this. Would you be interested in this? I can speak to, and I give them three topics, super casual. And I cannot remember the last time I spoke to a reporter on the phone. It's all via email. They don't have time yeah. to speak on the phone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I'll get so many pitches. Like, here's a bit, and like, oh, let's set up a call. Oh, Everyone wants to set up no. a call. They're, they're like, they're like sales reps. It's kind of like, no, I need the information now. The other thing yeah. I want to mention is, you know, like how much of your time, or like, how would, do you have advice around there of, of how much you invest in into PR because PR can be very time consuming. When you <laughs> mentioned Perry, I assumed this was your PR agency and you had a PR agency working. Oh, so the fact that. 
you're bootstrapping it, doing it yourself. Yeah. And I'm sure there's many other things you're doing. So like, how do you, how do you, have you balanced that time investment that PR takes? Yeah. I mean, so PR takes, you know, you have to do a lot of writing and, and a lot of, you know, creating, um, new and thought provoking content. So you can't use the same thing over and over again. I would say we're a startup. I don't have budget for a PR firm yet. When I do, I will be talking to Perry. Um, <laughs> I, I think that probably 50% of my time is spent on PR, which is more than media relations, right? It's like speaking submissions for our executives at events. It's award submissions. And at the end of the day, we're we're really focused on building this trust and credibility to, to be the most beloved, most trusted travel insurance company worldwide, eventually, currently in America. Um, and that takes an incredible amount of time and commitment. And I, I would say to people who don't have in-house communications or an in-house PR pro and they're early stage and they're looking to get a PR firm, I wouldn't expect much because you can't give that PR firm so much of your time and they're not living and breathing your product. You need to, in my opinion, have somebody in-house working on comms if you're early stage to be truly successful with your narrative from the get-go. And also, under since you're in house, like how much are you able to shape your narrative? Like how much you know? So like at a bigger company, it tends to be like it's just flowing down. These things are going on. Let's try to get press for them. But you know, you're there. You're it sounds like working directly with the CEO. Are you able to, you know, affect uh, the things they're doing in the product? Are you able to affect the things they're doing on the website or partnerships or different things they're doing to say like? Copy. I'm not just PR. Like, oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm product copy, website copy, blog copy, social copy. And PR messaging. So have so, you been able to say, hey, this would be newsworthy if we added this yes, topic or if we, or like, have you, you know, as you mentioned with the, um, you know, disclaimer copy, t- talk us through that. How have you right. done that? Well, so as long as things are compliant, we're okay, right? So everything needs to be compliant, creative and fun, but compliant. So I will send a batch of content to be reviewed all at once. And then if it's been reviewed, I will not send the same piece of content ever to get reviewed again, right? So that kind of, that that saves quite a bit of time that I have a bank of content. But, you know, I think when it comes to PR, you know, content has to be compliant when it comes to your product and services and travel insurance. When it comes to PR, well, we're providing commentary about the industry and and tips on holiday booking travel and um, third-party data based on studies we're doing. So I don't need to check that that's compliant. I mean, that has nothing... That has everything to do with what we can comment on and how we position ourselves, but nothing to do with our products specifically. Say travel insurance is getting mentioned in those stories because of our executives getting quoted, right? Um, so yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, but are up. you are you? I assume monitoring compliance there because when an executive is speaking on behalf of the company, someone needs to be protecting the brand. Are you if your CEO is yeah, commenting of there? Everything goes, so every piece of copy goes through me, social, blog, website, product, et cetera. Every, and everything that you see on the website or in the product itself also goes through compliance. And, and that adds another, it adds more time spent. I mean, it's not, it's not so quick to turn around copy like that, that needs to be reviewed for compliance. Yeah. That's always a challenge. Uh, Let's look at one more lesson here. If you're not embarrassed about the first iteration of the product you put out, then you're doing it wrong. And that's from Dan Green, the co-founder and CTO of Faye. So what can perfectionists learn from Dan? Wow. So, you know, working at Faye, um, I got the pleasure of seeing a product that didn't exist get created and then it was launched, right? And I think when you're about to launch a product for the first time, there are so many things that you wish it had that were on the original list that you had to put on the back burner because you need to get to the market ASAP, right? And we knew we have such a great product market fit. We knew how much everybody would love our product. And so some of those things had to be delayed a little bit, right? And I remember Dan saying that in a meeting, and I remember really taking that to heart. It doesn't always have to be perfect. I think that message applies to everything. And the first iteration of your product doesn't have to be perfect and we will fix things and we will iterate and we will improve and we will be the best, but it is okay to release something that is not perfect yet. Now, of course, we're perfect. It's been a few months. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and so, and how do you then get to perfect? And what I mean is, you know, there's that idea of the minimal viable product. I prefer minimum awesome product because, you know, sometimes you get 
one exposure to a customer, that first exposure, if it doesn't meet their needs or their wants or they don't think it's good enough, then they're gone. So, I mean, it has to be, a, yeah. well, it doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be a certain level of good or you're going to you know, lose that opportunity with them. So you mentioned A-B testing. Um, so yeah. what are you doing to then like, okay, learn about, you know, get that customer feedback from the customer, from your marketing to understand like, okay, here's the next iteration, next iteration. Here's how we need to improve. Because it's one thing to not yeah. be perfect coming out the gate, which I totally agree with. But then right. you better have some continuous improvement baked in, right? Oh, for sure. So we're constantly A-B testing. You know, we're constantly doing it with, uh, for example, like our our key call to action. You know, should it be get covered, you know, which is a little bit more fun, you know, protect your trip? Or should it be kind of what everybody's used to, which is get a quote, check pricing? And we had what we wanted it to be, and then we tested it. And check pricing really checked out. You know, it was what was converting the most. We also looked at, I would say, the purchase flow. So we saw where people were dropping off and we had some inklings as to why that was happening. And one of them was, hey, maybe we shouldn't ask for customer's full name first. Maybe they don't they don't want to provide that first. They want to provide their trip details first, where they're going and the dates, name later for example. And that also worked. But again, we tested it. We drove a specific amount of traffic there. We waited a bit. We looked at the numbers and then we optimized. That's a really interesting point because one thing um, I think about or I've written about too is the momentum marketing. The idea is like, how do you get that ball rolling with the customer? And so if you're starting with the thing the customer is most excited about, in this case, the trip, versus starting with the things that you want or need like email address or even worse phone number where they're like, oh, this is just a sales pitch. So I love that lesson. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, final question here. Uh, We've talked about all different things about what it means to be a marketer. Uh, What are the key qualities of an effective marketer in your opinion, Lauren? Effective marketer, I would say you have to be an excellent writer. You have to be scrappy. You pivot fast without getting emotional about it. I mean, you could have an amazing plan one day and the next day the company has completely changed course and you just, you can't cry about it. You got to just pick up and move on. Um, and I would say you think and plan ahead at a certain point as a marketer and a comms professional, you, you need to understand seasonality. You need to plan ahead. You need to plan, you know, a, a few months in advance to really nail your campaigns. It, if you have the resources, of course. That's what I would say. I like that. I like scrappy. I haven't, we've you know, asked a lot of people this question. I haven't, heard, I haven't heard of scrappy before, but it's very true. You've got to be scrappy, yeah. especially to start up. you got to just figure point, it out, right? Of course. You have to be scrappy. And it's like, you know, nowadays everyone's like, well, I just want to do one job, one specific role at the company. And and it's like in startup life, it's like, no, I'm, I'm wearing five to ten different hats a day. And I can't just be writing email marketing copy. That That's, that's not re- reality in startup land. In Startup Land, very true. Well, thank you for sharing your lessons from Startup Land, Lauren. It was very interesting. Thanks for having me. It was really fun. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Hope you got some good lessons for your marketing campaigns and career. Thank you for joining us for How I Made It in Marketing with Daniel Burstein. Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A.com.